And now Hugh Laurie continues his reading of The Hound of the Baskervilles by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Dr. Watson has discovered that the strange figure watching over the moor is none other than Sherlock Holmes. A crushing weight of responsibility seemed in an instant to be lifted from my soul. Holmes, I cried, I never was more glad to see anyone in my life. His eyes were dancing with amusement. Or more astonished, eh? But the surprise was not all on one side, I assure you. I had no idea you'd found my hideaway until I was within twenty paces of the door. If you seriously desire to deceive me, you must change your tobacconist. For when I see the stub of a cigarette marked Bradley, Oxford Street, I know that my friend Watson's in the neighbourhood. He glanced into the hut. Ha! Ah, I see the boys brought some supplies. And a note. Well, well. You've been to Coombe Tracy, have you? Yes, to see a Mrs. Laura Lyons. Well done, Watson. Our researches have evidently been running on parallel lines. And when we unite our results, I expect we'll have a fairly full knowledge of the case. I smiled at him. Well, I'm glad from my heart that you're here. The responsibility and the mystery were both becoming too much for my nerves. But how in the name of wonder did you come here? And what have you been doing? I thought you were in Baker Street. That's what I wished you to think. But then you use me, and yet you do not trust me, I cried. I think I've deserved better, Holmes. My dear fellow, you've been invaluable to me in this as in many other cases and I beg that you'll forgive me. Had I been with Sir Henry and you, my presence would have warned our very formidable opponents to be on their guard. As it is, I've been able to get about as I could not possibly have done had I been living at the hall, and you haven't been tempted to get word to me on the moor. But the reports I've sent to Baker Street have all been wasted. Holmes took a bundle of papers from his pocket. Here are your reports, my dear fellow, and very well thumbed. I've made arrangements and they're only delayed one day on their way. Now tell me what you know of Laura Lyons. There, sitting in the twilight, I told Holmes of my conversation with the lady, and when I'd finished, Holmes declared, Well, this fills a gap which I'd been unable to bridge. You're aware that a close intimacy exists between this lady and Stapleton? I shook my head. Oh, there can be no doubt. They meet, they write, there's a complete understanding between them. Now, this puts a very powerful weapon into our hands. If I could use it to detach his wife. His wife? Ha! Huh. I am giving you some information now in return for all that you've given me. The lady who's passed here as Miss Stapleton is, in reality, his wife. Good heavens, Holmes! Then how could he permit Sir Henry to fall in love with her? As you observed, Watson... He took particular care that Sir Henry did not make love to her. All my vague suspicions suddenly took shape and centred upon the naturalist. In that colourless man, with his straw hat and his butterfly net, I seemed to see something terrible, a creature of infinite patience and craft, with a smiling face and a murderous heart. It is he, then, who's our enemy and who's dogged us in London. So I read the riddle. And the warning letter must have come from her. Exactly, said Holmes. You remember he told you he was once a schoolmaster in the north of England. A little investigation showed me that a school had come to grief under atrocious circumstances, and that the man who'd owned it had disappeared with his wife. When I learned that the missing man was devoted to entomology, the identification was complete. I frowned. So if Miss Stapleton is his wife... Where does Mrs. Laura Lyons fit in? That's where your own researches have shed a light. I didn't know she hoped for a divorce. Clearly, regarding Stapleton as an unmarried man, she counted upon becoming his wife. And when she's undeceived? Then, Watson, we may find the lady of service. It must be our first duty to see her tomorrow. But don't you think you're away from Baskerville Hall rather long? The last red streaks had faded away in the west, and night had settled on the moor. Holmes peered into the blackness. 
It's murder, Watson. Refined, cold-blooded, deliberate murder. My nets are closing on Stapleton, even as his are upon Sir Henry. Another day or two, and I have my case complete. But until then, you guard your charge closely. As he spoke, a terrible scream, a prolonged yell of horror, burst out of the silence of the moor and turned the blood to ice in my veins. Holmes sprang to his feet. The cry had pealed from somewhere far off in the shadowy plain. Now it burst upon our ears, nearer, louder, more urgent than before. Where is it? Holmes whispered, and I knew from his voice that he, the man of iron, was shaken to the soul. Again the agonized cry swept through the silent night, louder and nearer than ever. And a new sound mingled with it, a deep, muttered rumble, musical and yet menacing, rising and falling like the low, constant murmur of the sea. The hound, cried Holmes. Come, Watson. Great heavens, if we're too late. Blindly we ran through the gloom, blundering against boulders, forcing our way through gorse bushes, panting up hills and rushing down slopes. A low moan came from our left. On that side, a ridge of rocks ended in a sheer cliff. On its jagged face was spread eagled the dark outline of a man. He lay face downwards on the ground, the head doubled under him at a horrible angle. So grotesque was the attitude that I could not for the instant realize that that moan had been the passing of his soul. Holmes laid his hand upon him and held it up again with an exclamation of horror. The gleam of the match which he struck shone upon his clotted fingers and upon the ghastly pool which widened slowly from the crushed skull of the victim. And it shone upon something else which turned our hearts sick and faint within us. The body of Sir Henry Baskerville. There was no chance of either of us forgetting that peculiar ruddy tweed suit, the very one which he'd worn on our first meeting in Baker Street. We caught the one clear glimpse of it, and then the match flickered and went out, even as the hope had gone out of our souls. Holmes groaned, and his face glimmered white through the darkness. Oh, the brute, I cried. Oh, Holmes, I shall never forgive myself for having left him to his fate. I am more to blame than you, Watson. In order to have my case well-rounded and complete, I've thrown away the life of my client. But how could I know that he'd risk his life alone on the moor in face of all my warnings? We stood with bitter hearts on either side of the mangled body. The agony of those contorted limbs struck me with a spasm of pain and blurred my eyes with tears. We must send for help, Holmes. We can't carry him all the way to the hall. But as I spoke, Holmes uttered a cry and bent over the body. Now he was dancing and laughing and wringing my hand. Could this be my stern, self-contained friend? A beard! The man has a beard! It's not the baronet, it's my neighbour, the convict! He turned the body over. There could be no doubt. It was the sunken animal face of Selden the criminal. In an instant, I remembered how the baronet had given Barrymore some clothes for the convict's escape. Then the clothes have been the poor fellow's death, said Holmes. The boot which was abstracted in the hotel has given the hound the scent. But why does the hound run loose tonight? Stapleton wouldn't let it go unless he had reason to think that Sir Henry would be on the moor. We might ask, I said, as I saw a figure approaching us over the moor, and recognized the dapper shape and jaunty walk of the naturalist. Why, Dr. Watson, you're the last man I should expect to see on the moor at this time of night. Oh, dear me, what's this? Is somebody hurt? Oh, don't tell me it's our friend Sir Henry. He hurried past me and stopped over the dead man. I heard a sharp intake of breath. Who, who's this? Selden, the man who escaped from Princetown. Stapleton turned a ghastly face upon us. But by a supreme effort, he'd overcome his amazement and his disappointment. He looked sharply from Holmes to me. He appears to have broken his neck falling over these rocks. 
Quite so, said Holmes. My friend and I were strolling on the moor when we heard a cry. I heard it also. I was uneasy about Sir Henry because I'd suggested he should come over. When he didn't arrive, I naturally became alarmed, and when I heard cries upon the moor, you didn't hear anything else besides? No, said Holmes. Did you? <laughs> But no. What do you mean then? Oh, you know, the stories that the peasants tell about a phantom hound and so on. I just wondered. Well, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, we've been expecting you in these parts since Dr. Watson arrived. It seems you're in time to see a tragedy. Holmes nodded. It makes an unpleasant remembrance to take back to London with me tomorrow. You return tomorrow? Holmes looked unconcerned. That's my intention. One can't always have success. An investigator needs facts, not legend and rumour. It has not been a satisfactory case. We covered the body as best we could, and resisting Stapleton's offer of hospitality, Holmes and I set off to Baskerville Hall. What a nerve that fellow has, Watson. I told you in London, and I'll tell you again, we've never had a foeman more worthy of our steel. Back at the hall, I went to break the news to the Barrymores, whilst Holmes went to find Sir Henry. He'd suggested that we keep to the story that the convict had merely had a fatal fall in the dark, and that we make no mention of the hound. When I found them in the dining room, the baronet was asking Holmes if he was any the wiser about his own case. Holmes gave nothing away. It's a difficult and complicated business. There are several points upon which we still want light, but it's coming. I think I'll be in a position to make the situation clearer to you before long. But in the meantime, I may need your help. Whatever you tell me, I'll do. I shall ask you to do it blindly, without always asking the reason. Just as you like. Holmes nodded absently. He was staring fixedly over my head, and though his features were composed, His eyes shone with exultation. Excuse the admiration of a connoisseur, said he as he waved his hand towards the line of portraits which covered the opposite wall. Now these are really very fine. That's a Nella, and the stout gentleman with the wig ought to be a Reynolds. They're family portraits, I presume? Sir Henry smiled. Every one. Barrymore has been coaching me in them. The gentleman with the telescope is Rear Admiral Baskerville. The man with the blue coat and the roll of paper is Sir William. And this cavalier opposite me? asked Holmes. Ah, you've a right to know him, the wicked Sir Hugo who started the Hound of the Baskervilles. I gazed with interest at the portrait. Dear me, said Holmes, he seems a meek mannered man. But I dare say there was a lurking devil in his eyes. Holmes said little more, but the picture of the old roisterer seemed to have a fascination for him, and his eyes were continually fixed on it during supper. It wasn't until Sir Henry had gone to his room that he stood upon a chair, and holding a candle in his left hand, he curved his right arm over the plumed hat and round the long ringlets. Good heavens! I cried in amazement. The face of Stapleton had sprung out of the canvas. Quite, my dear Watson. It's an interesting throwback, which seems to me both physical and spiritual. The fellow is a Baskerville, that's evident. With designs upon the succession. Exactly. We have him, Watson, and I dare swear that before tomorrow night he'll be fluttering in our net as helpless as one of his own butterflies. Hugh Laurie has been reading The Hound of the Baskervilles by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. The programme was abridged and produced for Radio 2 by Jane Marshall Productions.